Welcome once again, dear friends, to this second seminar dealing with biblical Christian Zionism. Just by way of reminder, Zionism is the belief that the land of Israel is the everlasting possession of the Jewish people for the sake of world redemption. That's the definition of biblical Christian Zionism. In this seminar today, we will be looking at the four great covenants of biblical Christian Zionism. Amazing, the four great covenants that govern all of history. And these are written about extensively in the pages of Scripture. So these four covenants actually govern history. All of history has been regulated by them. Might sound strange, but it's absolutely true. <clears throat> and that remains until today. Actually, each and every one of these covenants are still in operation and are therefore still applicable to each and every one of us. Now, that might be strange because most Christians only think of the new covenant. And for them, all the other covenants are sort of blurred and uh, they don't really bother with them because uh, they Old Testament, as it were. And uh, so we can just write them off, but that's not true. In fact, all of these covenants are reinforced and entrenched in the New Covenant Scriptures, and we need to know that. More than that, they are interconnected. All of them are interconnected. And therefore, they give us the harmony of the Bible. You will never understand the unity or the harmony of the Bible if you do not understand how the great covenants of this book are interconnected. So there are four great covenants that govern history. The first one we've mentioned briefly in our first seminar, and that is the Abrahamic covenant. In that seminar, I said the following, that this is the most important covenant in the Bible. That's true. And that is because it constitutes God's decision to save the world. Did you hear that? It constitutes God's decision to save the world. Now, the new covenant is the most essential covenant in the Bible because it constitutes God's ability to save the world. But if you have to weigh the two, which is more important? Let me put it this way. If you need $200,000 by tomorrow morning, and I have that bulging in my pockets, cash, the fact that I've got it means nothing, absolutely nothing. What you need from me is a decision to give it to you. So that decision actually is more important than the fact that I have it. But I better have it because I can only make good my decision if I've got it. And that's the difference between the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is God's decision to save the world. The new covenant is God's ability to pay the price for world redemption. So the Abrahamic covenant then is the most important of all. Without this decision, the world would still be lost, would go to hell, would be damned. It is the Abrahamic covenant wherein God says, I'm going to bless the whole world with salvation. Now, that may be startling for many, but equally startling is the fact that in Galatians 3, where we have an extensive exposition of the Abrahamic covenant, the Apostle Paul says that the first proclamation of the gospel was in fact this covenant. Again, of course, because it's, it's the decision to save the world. So the gospel of Jesus Christ didn't start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the record of Messiah's life and coming and passion. 
But in Galatians 3 and verse 8, the Bible says the following, And the Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations, that's the goyim, Gentiles, shall be blessed, saved. God preached the gospel to Abraham. And this was God's decision to do that. How wonderful it was to see that Abraham understood everything. You know, he held in his own life the DNA pertaining to all of world redemption, even the death of Christ, because he saw it as we saw in our previous study. So, Scripture even tells us in Luke chapter 1 that John the Baptist and even Jesus came into the world in order to fulfill the promises that God made to Abraham 2,000 years before. You can read that in Luke chapter 1. You will find in uh, the uh, eulogy that is given by, by John the Baptist's father and by Mary, where they both acknowledge that John has come because God has been faithful to the promise he made to Abraham. And Mary, in her wonderful eulogy, says exactly the same thing. In other words, the Abrahamic covenant was a decision, but it needed the other covenants in order to have executive authority. And that's the picture of the Bible. Now, as we've noted in our first study, the Abrahamic covenant is unconditional because Abraham proved to God that he was faithful and trustworthy and would do all that God told him. Would to God that we could be like that. God told him, kill your son. And he did it. God stopped him, but he did it because he received him back from the dead because he did it in his heart. He thus became, as Isaiah 41 and verse 8 says, the friend of God. All the promises in the Abrahamic covenant from that point onwards became everlasting. And that's important for us to understand. And thus, the Abrahamic covenant in no way and in any way can ever be changed, annulled, abolished or altered. And that's what the Bible tells us. God does not lie. In the book of Hebrews, the writer who I believe is Paul is uh, seeking to encourage these believers because they were tempted to fall away from Christ and abandon their faith. And the manner in which he assures them that God is faithful to them and they should not give up even because they were suffering persecution is that they should look at the Abrahamic covenant because God has always kept all his promises to them in it even the coming of Christ. And so we read in Hebrews chapter 6 and uh, verse 13, the following, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath, for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us, speaking of Christ. He says, you can trust God forever. Why? Because he will forever be faithful to every part of the Abrahamic covenant. And more than that, he swore by two things, by his character and by his word, that the Abrahamic covenant would never change. Why? Because God cannot lie. So, the implications of this are incredible, especially since in many segments of the church today, 
the Abrahamic covenant is said to have been abolished and in fact done away with and in fact is not everlasting as God said and in fact is no longer applicable and in fact meaning that the land of Canaan is no longer the everlasting possession of the people of Israel. That, my friends, is a lie. And the New Testament affirms it by two immutable things, by which it is impossible for God to lie, by his word and his character. He swore that the Abrahamic covenant is still applicable. So, this covenant has several components, all of which make up the one covenant of Abraham. Much like a watch, I have this watch on my arm, it has uh, multiple parts in it, but all of them are vital to the proper working of my watch. If I take one part out, in fact, the whole falls to pieces because the components are as much a part of the whole as they are individual segments. And they are crucial, each one, to the sanctity of the working of the whole. So the Abrahamic covenant then has three major components and we need to understand them. These are the call of God over Abraham and his people to be the vehicle of world redemption. The Jewish people are the means by which God has brought his salvation message to the world. And we saw that when I recorded the fact that Jesus said salvation is of the Jews. And we read from Romans chapter 9, where we are reminded that everything we hold dear as Christians is Jewish. Yes, indeed. The Bible teaches us that the Jewish people are the vehicle of world redemption. Thank God for them. Thank God that he gifted us with a people that he brought together supernaturally in Abraham by which through their land and their journey they could give redemptive products to us. Isn't that incredible? Absolutely amazing. The second component of this covenant is the promise that the land of Canaan would henceforth be the everlasting possession of the Jewish people. We read about that in our first seminar from Psalm 105, 7 to 12. We read about that in Genesis chapter 17 and verses 7 to 8, where God says, I'm giving you this land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, not as an end in itself, but a means to an end, which is your salvation and mine. So the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, to this day belongs to the Jewish people. And that's the end, actually, and will be the conflict end of the so-called Middle East conflict today. I promise you. And thirdly, the Abrahamic covenant gives a promise of a coming Messiah who would save the nations from their sins. You know, in Genesis chapter 22 and verses 15 to 17, where God says that in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. In that context there, it's singular, not plural, the word that is used, meaning there is one descendant that will arise out of Israel. And what he does will bring forth eternal salvation for the Jewish people. And... Uh, the fourth component, actually, the four, the fourth component of the Abrahamic covenant is it provides protection for Israel uh, as the custodians of world redemption. And that is, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. Why is that so? Because as we've noted, they carry in their journey through their land which is everlastingly given to them, God's purpose of saving the world. Therefore, if in that journey you curse them, God will curse you. And if you bless them, God will bless you. Because to bless them is to bless what God is doing for the salvation of the world. That still applies, as we shall see. 
So this Abrahamic covenant is therefore the most important covenant in the whole of the Bible because, as I said, it constitutes God's decision to save the world. And none of these components, all four of them, none of them have failed. It's like a watch. If one fails, they all fail. It's one covenant having four components. The next great covenant of the Bible is what we call the Mosaic Covenant, the law of Moses. And in this regard, we need to know there are three parts to the law of Moses. There's a civil law, which has to do how you eat and drink and how you go to the toilet, in fact. You can read about it in the book of Leviticus. That has been abolished. There is also a liturgical law, that is the tabernacle service of worship and sacrifice. That too has been abolished, these having been fulfilled in the person of Christ. But there is a moral law, or what we call the majestic law, known as the Ten Commandments, that has never been abolished and never will, actually. And Jesus said as much. And uh, we need to listen to the words of Jesus as he speaks about the law. There is such ignorance about the law in the Christian church, and Jesus knew that. So in Matthew chapter 5, recognising that people would confuse his coming with some type of attempt to abolish the law. He says this, Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfil. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. And uh, then he says this, Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. How wonderful if you teach and entrench the Ten Commandments, you will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that interesting? Why? So that's why we need to understand the Mosaic law. The first question is, in this regard, is why did God give the law? The book of Galatians actually tells us that it was added to the Abrahamic covenant. In other words, you can't add something to nothing. So here we get a little insight again as to the interconnectedness of the covenants. The Bible says that it was added to the Abrahamic covenant. Chapter 3 of Galatians, verse 19. And he says this, What purpose then does the law serve? That's the question I'm asking you. It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. <clears throat> it was added. Why did God have to add the majestic law or the Ten Commandments to the Abrahamic covenant? He's talking about the Ten Commandments here. Why did he have to do that? Well, the answer is simple. That the world is incapable of knowing that it needs to be saved. As I quoted before from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, Paul says, The natural man does not desire the things of God, neither can he. If you go outside of the walls today of your building and you meet someone in the street and you say to them, Well, my friend, you need to be saved. Most likely they'll look at you and say, Are you mad? From what? Good question. From what? And that's precisely why God gave the Mosaic Covenant. In other words, it is a teacher designed to show us that we need to be saved and that we need to run to Jesus for that salvation. That is the major purpose of the law because sin can only be understood or defined in the context of breaking the Ten Commandments. That's what the Bible says, in fact. That's what sin is. That's how we understand it. Sin is not something nebulous, not something naughty. It's just not something that we do wrong. 
Sin is rebellion against the Ten Commandments. You shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not blaspheme. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not covet. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall serve me with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. These, my friends, we have all broken. And these bring us under the curse of the law. There's nothing wrong with the law because the law, according to Paul, is the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When Moses received the tablets of the Ten Commandments, his face shone with the glory of God. These express the character of God. And we, each one, have broken all of these millions of times. And we can never, ever, by our own strength, reach them. So the law is a teacher then to bring us to Christ. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24, the Apostle Paul says this, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified, that is, be saved by faith in what he did on the cross. And that's why the Mosaic law is still so powerful. If we want to preach the gospel properly and see people getting saved, the best way to do it is to preach on the Ten Commandments because then we give the Holy Spirit something by which to convict the sinner of. The Mosaic Covenant, if we use it, is a very powerful tool. Paul said, by the law comes the knowledge of sin. We will beat our breasts, fall humbly before God, repent of our pitiful condition, and ask him to save us. Now I'm sure that you've heard of the Methodist Church. Well, have you ever thought about that name? Now quite frankly, that's a silly name for a church. What's the name of your church? Our church is the Church of the Method. Hmm. It's like you saying to me, what's the name of your church? I'll say, well, you know, my church is the church of administration. You look at me and say, have you lost your marbles? So we've become so comfortable with the use, using the term Methodist that we don't think about it, do we? But in John Wesley's day, who was the founder of the Methodist church with his brother, Charles Wesley, they were scoffed at and laughed at and persecuted for it. But the question is, why did they call themselves the Church of the Method? The truth is that they can teach us a lesson. John Wesley would ride into a town on his faithful horse, actually by the name of Dobbin. His horse was his means of conveyance. It was his Mercedes Benz. It was also his pulpit from which he preached. It was also his rapid means of escape. And he would ride into a village and then, my friends, he would preach from the Ten Commandments for a whole week, every day on another commandment. Can you imagine? And thousands and thousands were brought out by the Holy Spirit to hear him without internet, without social media, without fax machines, without emails, without videos. The Holy Spirit knew a preacher had arrived in town who could preach the truth. And then after a week, he galloped away and came back the next week and found the people under great conviction of sin. And then he preached the cross of Jesus and told them to run to the cross to escape the wrath and the curse of the law that will send you to hell. The Bible says that if we have Jesus in our hearts and lives, dear friends, the Bible says that he actually fulfills the law in us. We no longer blaspheme. We no longer swear. We no longer commit adultery. We no longer cheat. We no longer fornicate. We only serve God. Can you see how the law is so important? Paul said that Jesus died 
in Romans chapter 8, verse 4, in order that the requirement of the law, which is the glory of God, might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to it. We can't walk according to the law in our own strength. And we can't walk in the flesh. We need the power of Jesus to release us from our sins, all of them, and to give us the power to live a new life. The law, my friends, is so important. That's why in John we read that he says, the law was given through Moses, not by Moses, through Moses. God gave it. But grace and truth came through Christ. The law will convict you. It'll damn you. It'll curse you. But the grace to be freed from it and to live it out spontaneously is given in Christ. How wonderful. What a wonderful God we serve. And then the next great covenant in the Bible is the new covenant. And so this is the interconnectedness of the Bible. The law is added to the Abrahamic covenant in order to teach us to run to the new covenant for deliverance from the curse of God. The new covenant is therefore God's ability in Christ to save us. What a wonderful thing. The new covenant is God's ability in Christ, my friends, to save us from our sins and from his wrath. Jesus died to free us from our sins and from the curse of the law. Listen to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. How wonderful that is. That's what Jesus did for you and for me. But we need the Mosaic law so that we can understand what sin is, what the wrath of God is all about and why we are cursed and why in our own efforts we cannot be saved. But in many cases, in many churches throughout the world, the law, the Ten Commandments, which were once emblazoned upon the walls of the sanctuaries, have been removed. And so the knowledge of sin has been watered down. Lawlessness abounds. And people no longer repent. May God help us to understand the Mosaic Covenant. So this remarkable theological truth teaches us that all these things have happened so that God could fulfill the promises he made in the Abrahamic covenant. Listen to Galatians chapter 3 again. Now you will see how suddenly the Abrahamic covenant is validated with power and efficacy in the New Testament. Because we read this in Galatians 3 and verse 9. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. It's all to fulfill the promise in Abraham. Listen to verse 14, for instance. It says in verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Verse 14 so that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. Again, to fulfill the promises in Abraham. And look at verse 29. And it says this, And if you are Christ's, if you belong to Jesus, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So if you belong to Jesus, actually, you're not simply in the new covenant, but you've been placed into the Abrahamic covenant and are an heir of the promises that God gave there. This is where it began. So how did I get into the Abrahamic covenant? If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's children according to the covenant. How did I get there? By virtue of the Mosaic covenant and the new covenant. 
how wonderful God is. And uh, what a wonderful testimony this passage is to the power of the Abrahamic covenant that God has given to Israel, my friends. The land of Israel is an everlasting possession to this day for the purpose of world redemption. Then there's one final covenant that governs history, the Davidic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant, the most important. The Mosaic covenant, the covenant of instruction. The new covenant, the most essential, the covenant of God's ability. The Davidic covenant, the most glorious, because it's the covenant of triumph. This is the covenant of triumph. The faithful children of Israel and the church have been the most despised and persecuted people on the earth. Hebrews 11 tells us their story. If you read their story of the great heroes of faith, of those wonderful old Hebrew saints. Some of them were sawn in two, they were persecuted. It says Moses left the passing pleasures of Egypt to follow Christ in a wilderness. Man, these people were despised. Even the writer says, let's go outside the camp. The world despises us and hates us. Let us go outside and identify our lives with Jesus. But the Bible tells us that we are destined, see, not just to be children of God, what God came to find in Abraham was heirs, that is, vice regents. And you know, little is preached about it because, again, little is known of these great covenants. The idea is that we begin to reign with Christ, we become vice regents, we become royalty. And it's the Davidic covenant that guarantees that. And that's a wonderful thing. You know, in the book of Revelation, we read this about our destiny. Listen to chapter 2 of the book of Revelation. And uh, the last part, it says, it says this in verse 26, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give the power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. In chapter 3, it says this, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So you see, the Davidic covenant promised David that the Messiah would not simply be a priestly, Messiah, sacrificing his life for the world, but he would be a kingly one. And that is that he would be the son of David. And the people so saved would rule with him. That's why at the end of the book of Revelation, the Lord Jesus actually says that he's coming again. And he's coming as David. He's coming as a king to be with his fellow kings who will reign with him, his vice regents. Listen to this. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. We know from the Gospels that Jesus assumed the title of the son of David. The Davidic covenant spoke of this and guaranteed that the Messiah would be a king with his people. So we find in Luke chapter 1 and verse 31 following, listen to these remarkable words that preceded the very birth of Jesus. Listen to this. In uh, Luke chapter 1, and we read from verse 31. And I hope you've been following in your Bibles with me, dear friends, just as a reminder. Luke chapter 1. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Highest. So he's the Son of the Highest. He's the Saviour. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. He's the king, the Davidic covenant. And he will reign over the house of Jacob, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Wonderful. 
and that's the Davidic covenant. And you can read about that in, uh, in the Kings and uh, the Chronicles of that great day when David was promised that one would come from him who would be this king. You can read that in 1 Chronicles 17 and 11 to 14. Please do. That's the annunciation of the Davidic covenant. Now, the morning star is interesting. The Bible says, for those who are faithful, who love Jesus and serve him, that's you and me. The Bible says God will give them, give us the morning star. Now, one cannot see the morning star here. In your nations, some of you can. If you're living in the Middle East, you can. But when I lived in Jerusalem, I could walk out in the patio in the morning when all the other stars had gone out and I could look over the whole of the city of Jerusalem and there was the morning star. And as this radiance of light exploded from the horizon up into the sky, the morning star was like a throne just sitting there. The morning star is a symbol of David's throne. And Jesus says, you know, he who overcomes, I will give him the morning star. So it's a throne set against a backdrop of glorious light. And that's what Jesus is going to give to us. And the Bible says it's coming a day. You can read it in Second Peter. I'll read it to you. And chapter 1 and verse 19, when if we remain faithful to Jesus, that day will rise in our hearts. Kingship will arrive and uh, we will rule with him. And this is what it says. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns. That's the backdrop and the morning star rises in your hearts. That's the coming of Christ to place us on a throne. Abrahamic covenant, unconditional, everlasting, promising salvation, teaching the world about sin and telling us that we are heirs who will reign with Christ world without end. Amen. We are at uh, Ben Gurion Airport and we are waiting for the plane to arrive soon with 94 new immigrants from the former Soviet Union. Normally, the welcome hall here at Ben Gurion Airport is packed with people, but you can see it's fairly quiet today. All the flights in and out of Israel have been canceled for about 10 weeks now because of the coronavirus. But the flights that are coming in are bringing Jews home from all around the world. The first flight from the ICJ arrived at the 28th of May in 1990. I, as a volunteer, I arrived one week later, the 5th of June, 30 years ago. And that makes this day so special because over all these 30 years, the ICJ has been so faithful to bring the new immigrants from the former Soviet Union and actually from all the four corners of this earth, but so much with an accent on the, the Russian Jews. They came to the land by the help actually from supporters all around the world and so many believers are actually involved in this special day today. We were the first Christian ministry to sponsor Jews flying home to Israel to rejoin the Jewish people here in their ancient homeland. 30 years later, tens of thousands of Russian and Ethiopian and Indian and immigrants from all over the world, we've been helping them come home. In the beginning years, um, I also went for a um, welcoming to the airport and I just wanted to be there with my flag and say welcome. 
And there I stood with all these people who were waiting for family members. And then the lay, and I started to cry. I was standing with my flag and it touched me so much to see this fulfillment and I cried. And the lady beside me, she asked, for whom are you waiting? And I said, I only could say, I'm waiting for all of them, for all of them to come. We have some more coming home today, but more want to come. And we need your help to sponsor their flights. Please support the Aliyah efforts of the International Christian Embassy. Come and be involved with your prayers, first of all, most important, and with your generous giving.